thank you for the men who joined and were drafted and served and yet lost their lives in their service to protect us and our freedoms. And we just like to pray your blessing on their families today, their uh, descendants, uh, that you would watch over their families, that you would give them the opportunity to know you as Savior, and that you would bless them richly today and in the days to come as we recognize their sacrifice and their loss. And you we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we forget, and it takes a while uh, tr trying to live as a Christian to know that it is impossible in our own strength and in the flesh to keep the commands of God that are revealed in the Bible. It's beyond our natural ability to be able to do that. So we must rely uh, on His Spirit who indwells us and who lives in us. Some of God's commands that we encounter in the Bible, and they're throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, seem more than difficult. In fact, they seem impossible. For example, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48 says, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we know that, that we, we have perfection through Jesus Christ, by putting on Jesus Christ. But while we're here, in our behavior, in our lives, we should seek to fulfill that command. But it's very difficult if you're just doing it in your own strength. In all of history, no human being has ever come close to keeping that command except Jesus Christ. Uh, could anybody have claimed to have achieved perfect obedience even to the two greatest commandments, to love God with all your heart, all your being, and to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself? I mean, the two greatest commands, uh, we would fall far short in our actual performance of achieving that. Well, Paul is going to give us commands in 1 Thessalonians as he closes his first letter to these new believers under persecution in Thessalonica. And he writes, Rejoice always, <clears throat> pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What would our lives look like if we took these three commands to heart and sought to live them out? They are three seemingly impossible commands from God. I mean, if only Paul had said, rejoice a lot, or pray often, or try and be thankful if you're in the mood to do so. Uh, we could say to that, okay, you know, I'll try and do that. But nobody can honestly say, I always rejoice, I always pray without ceasing, and in everything that comes down the pike, I give thanks. And we cannot really honestly resolve to even start keeping these commands now. And even if we did resolve that, by the end of this coming week, we could not honestly say, I have perfectly kept these commands all last week. There was not a single moment or instant in thought or deed when I wasn't rejoicing and praying and giving thanks. <clears throat> so, what do we do with these commands that are here in this letter? One commentator tries to explain, explain it by saying that Paul is not directing these commands to us individually, that he's directing these commands to us as the church together in public worship. Well, indeed, our worship together should be filled with joy and happiness and gratitude and prayer, but there are many other places in the Bible where there are commands for us individually to rejoice and be glad in the Lord. And... Uh, we won't get together and worship together and do these things if we hadn't been doing them individually throughout the week. So I think these commands apply to us individually first, and then when we get together, they apply to us as the church together in worship. One thing is clear when you read these commands, even the verses before them and after them, is that Paul, right here, he doesn't offer any explanation about the commands. He doesn't explain the commands. He doesn't offer any help on what these commands mean or on how we can obey them. He just states them kind of like machine gun fire. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks. You know, just do these things even though we don't know how. But thankfully, other scriptures do help us understand these commands and how we can obey them. These other scriptures help us develop the attitudes 
and the habits to move toward the mark of perfectly obeying these commands that Paul has given the Thessalonian believers and has given to us. And then to make it even harder on us, he adds, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, you might have trouble discerning God's will for you in some areas of your life at times. But this is very clear. It is God's will for you and for you to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. That we are to be that way and live that way. So I want to take a few minutes this morning in the time that we have and look at these three commands. I'm going to start with rejoice always. And I'm going to spend more time on this one than I do the others. And for each one of these commands, we're going to ask ourselves, what does this mean? And how can we actually apply it? How can we develop the habits that will allow us to keep this command? Does rejoicing always mean that you always go around with a big smile on your face and an upbeat kind of tigger bounce in your step? You know? uh, are you sinning? If you ever feel sad or depressed or upset or grieved, well, some people seem to think so. I have known people before, well-meaning people, who have had a major problem in their lives or a major loss in their lives that when they were asked, well, how are you doing? That they thought it was unspiritual to answer, well, honestly, I'm really struggling. I could use your help. I could use your prayers. Uh, I need the Lord today like I've never needed him before. They felt somehow that it was unspiritual to say that they were hurting or grieving, to honestly confess that. But I want to tell you that you can honestly confess that you're struggling, that you're hurting, or that you're grieving, and still keep the command to rejoice always and still praise the Lord. You don't have to deny reality in order to legitimately praise the Lord. If rejoicing always means always being upbeat and never feeling sad, then we have a real problem because in the scriptures, neither Jesus nor Paul were always happy. You know what the shortest verse in the Greek New Testament is? Rejoice always. Do you know what the shortest verse translated in the English New Testament is? Jesus wept. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, when Jesus was facing the cross, it says he prayed with vehement, that means loud, cries and tears. That wasn't particularly happy. That might not have been the greatest testimony if you think it's unspiritual to admit that you ever feel poorly or feel sad. Paul described himself this way one time as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. He told that to the Corinthians. And then he tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. He does not say to exhort those who are weeping to stop weeping and start rejoicing. He says, come alongside, join in it with them. So rejoice always does not mean to deny your feelings and to put on a happy but false face and never feel sad. And the Bible acknowledges that sometimes God even brings the trials into our lives himself in order to train us. Look at what it says in Hebrews 12. Now, no chastening, meaning all discipline, seems uh, to be joyful for the present. It's never fun when it's happening. It seems painful or sorrowful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained. So what does Paul mean when he says rejoice always? Now I want you to remember that he wrote this letter to relatively new believers who are suffering persecution, not just because people don't like them in general, but because they're Christians, because they're people of faith, people who say they follow Jesus Christ, people who are trying to keep the obey, uh, commandments of God, just like these commands. They are suffering because of their faith. And he's just exhorted them that when they are mistreated by people, not to get revenge, not to get even. And so he, 
He's teaching them these things. And so while he was there for a short time with them, he probably taught them the words of Jesus, which said in Matthew 5, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice <laughs> and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Or as the Apostle James put it, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Or, another time as Paul wrote, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. So given their difficult circumstances, this command to rejoice has to be seen and understood not as a matter of how they felt, because we don't always feel like that, but as a matter of obedience. When we find ourselves in difficult trials or when people have mistreated us because of our faith, we have a choice clearly before us. Uh, we can either focus on our trials and fall into self-pity, or we can, as Colossians 3 says, set our minds on the things above where Christ is at the right hand of God, where our life is hidden in him, and rejoice. And as Paul commanded the Philippians, as I read to you to open the service this morning, rejoice in the Lord always, again, I will say rejoice. And that little phrase, in the Lord, is the key. We are eternally in the Lord. And we can always rejoice in the Lord. No matter whatever else is or isn't happening around us and in our lives, we can always rejoice in the Lord. Now, our joy is not totally oblivious to our circumstances, is it? We feel things. But neither is our joy governed by our circumstances. There's a little fine line of balance between those two things that we are to walk. So rejoicing always is a conscious, intentional attitude of contentment and hope and joy that comes from deliberately focusing on Jesus Christ and the eternal treasures of heaven that we have received and will receive. Let's be honest, sometimes we have to fight to have or to feel the joy that we have in the Lord. Amen. And we see this so often in the Psalms. A psalm will begin with the psalmist crying out to the Lord for help in the midst of some life-threatening trial. But by the end of the psalm, that same psalmist who is crying out for help is praising the Lord and rejoicing in the Lord even if his circumstances have not yet changed. He's changed. Whether the circumstances have. And that, that's one of the things that happens to us when we go to the Lord with joy, in prayer, with thanks. He works in us. He makes a change in us as we walk through this what some people call in this life a veil of tears. He's changed whether his circumstances have or not. And what changed happened because he deliberately focused on the Lord. And this is so important that I want to illustrate it to you with one of the Psalms. In Psalm 5, David uh, is groaning and crying out for help. He's groaning because of his enemies. And this is how he describes his enemies whose inward part was destruction, and their throats were an open grave. And then David decides he's going to do something extremely wise. He is going to meditate on God and on God's abundant loving kindness. He's just going to concentrate on God. And after having done so, David, whose enemies are still throat, with throats like an open grave, snapping at his heels, this is how he concludes in triumph. But let all those who rejoice put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy, because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. 
For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him as with a sheep. And you meditate on that and the person who does that uh, for you, God, and who he is. And things just come into perspective. Things that you thought were insurmountable just get whittled down to size. And the Lord rushes in as your helper. Paul himself displayed this deliberate joy in the Lord in his life. He was unjustly arrested, beaten without a trial, and thrown into stocks in the Philippian jail along with Silas. And at midnight, after being treated like that, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. You know what the outcome of that was, but they didn't know what the outcome was going to be at the time, and this is what they were doing. The same was true of the apostles. The Jewish leaders had flogged them for preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and this is what the Bible reads after they had been flogged. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame. Rejoice always means that we are to deliberately focus on the Lord and on his tremendous riches that he gives to us and not on our difficult circumstances. We don't deny our troubles. We don't pretend our troubles don't affect us and our feelings. But it does mean that in spite of these troubles, we focus on the Lord and take joy in when we do that, folks, no matter what else is happening or not happening, no one can strip us of our joy in the Lord. Most everything else can be taken away from you. There are some things that can't be taken away from you. Your thoughts, your education, your relationships, and what you have in the Lord. Everything else can pretty much be stripped away. And if we do all these things, if we endure all things with joy in the Lord, rather than with grumbling and complaining, the Bible says that we will stand out as lights in this dark world. Listen to what it says in Philippians 2. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights of that's a light on a hill, isn't it? That salt that hasn't lost its flavor, is it not? <clears throat> Persecution and trouble was either the present reality of these believers at Thessalonica, or it was always there on the horizon. It was always there threatening these believers. And you make no mistake, their lives were very hard. But they found a way to fasten their attention more on the Lord than on their trouble. Are you listening? They found a way to fasten their attention more on their spiritual riches in Christ Jesus than on their poverty on earth. And they found a way to fasten their attention more on their glorious futures than they did on their difficult present. It didn't deny anything. It didn't go around falsely. It's what they deliberately chose to do. That's what rejoicing always means. Well, here's the second question we want to ask about the command. How can we develop the habit of rejoicing always? How can we do it? Well, one thing is that each day focus on the good things from God. Focus on the riches that he has given to us in Christ Jesus. Uh, we know from the Bible that we have all spiritual blessings in him. He has chosen you. God loves you. He has adopted you into his family through Jesus Christ. He has freely bestowed his grace on you. And in Christ you have redemption and forgiveness of sins and cleansing. And he has made his will known to you. And he's given you an inheritance. And he sealed you in his Holy Spirit. Now what was your problem? What problem do you have that's threatening to crush everything above all these blessings. We can also walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Joy, according to Galatians 5.22, is a fruit of the spirit. So every day, 
consciously, deliberately, intentionally, if we yield to Him and rely on His Spirit to lead our lives in every situation, over time, it will produce fruit. It takes time to produce fruit. And if you walk consistently by the Spirit and in the Spirit, the fruit of joy will be yours. And then the third thing is this. Sing. Um, when you feel troubled, down, distressed, get out a hymn book or book of praise if you don't have them floating around in your head already. And sing about God's goodness and His grace and His love. And sing often. And set your mind on things above. You know, over uh, a couple of days, over the last couple of weeks, for no reason, extra reason, I've just felt, and this is the, I've just felt a profound sense of loss. Amen. Just people gone. It was just a huge sense of loss, feeling-wise. Well, I was driving, as Red Neckerson said, in my truck, and I just decided to sing. And it brought it, me out of it. It made me feel better. And you know what I sang? The list of choruses was sung this morning. And I thought, God, that's good. I don't have to pick music this week. There it is. You know? <laughs> we sang, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. We sang something beautiful. We sang, I will serve thee. We sang, the more I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Praise the name of Jesus. I love you, Lord. That's just what came to me a lot. And I thought, well, that'd be good for us to sing this morning. So whether you wanted to enter into my experience or not, you have. <laughs> if we do these things, it will help us develop the attitude and the stance and the habitual response, response of rejoicing always. And then we have to deliberately choose in the midst of whatever circumstances we're in to focus on Jesus Christ and the riches that we have in Him and the future that we have in Him. Okay? Even though the circumstances haven't changed. Rejoice always. We can't do this in God, in His strength, in the Holy Spirit. And then He says, pray without ceasing. Again, what, <laughs> what can this command mean? Does it mean that we are to actively pray every waking moment? Well, it'd be hard to earn a living. Uh, it'd be hard to get dinner ready. And I don't know about you, that's important to me. <laughs> you know, it'd be hard to get the grass cut. Uh, that word translated without ceasing, let me tell you how that was used in ancient history. It was used to describe a hacking cough. Now, a person with a bad hacking cough does not cough continuously, although it seems like it to the person. But they do cough often and repeatedly. Another way that word without ceasing was used was to describe <coughs> milita repeated military attacks where an army is besieging a city and they attack and fail. They fall back, regroup, and attack again. And they regroup and attack again and they keep the siege up. They keep attacking until they have won the victory. See, our prayer should be frequent. <coughs> and persistent. We keep on knocking. You know that passage in Luke chapter 11 where a guy's turned in for the night and his neighbor comes knocking on the door wanting a loaf of bread? <clears throat> well, he should have planned better, shouldn't he? I mean, he didn't know he's going to have visitors, but he, everybody ought to have a loaf of bread in the house, you know? I'm not getting that to get that dipstick a loaf of bread when he couldn't plan any better than that. He kept knocking at me and finally says, I'll get the loaf of bread and give it to you. Or in Luke 18, where the widow keeps uh, coming back to and bothering the unjust judge. And 
her we should keep praying until we have an answer. And the answer might be no. The answer might be wait. The answer might be yes. It might be a sense of relief that it's been answered without knowing exactly what the answer is. But we should pray frequently and persistently, keep on knocking until we get an answer. Now, rejoicing always and praying without ceasing are closely related. Uh, through prayer, we lay hold of the riches that we have in Jesus Christ, which is part of our joy. And it is in prayer that we lay hold to and claim the promises of God given to us in Scripture, even in the midst of our trials. And when we pray and we lay hold of the promises of God, we know and realize all over again that God is for us. He's not against us. He's for us. As Paul wrote, if God is for us, who can be? anything, anybody. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Well, if the, demand, if the command means pray often, pray frequently, pray uh, persistently, how can we develop the habit, the lifelong process of praying without ceasing, like a hacking cough, <laughs> like repeated military attacks? Well, we can realize that we just can't do life on our own. You know, we are far more dependent on God than we recognize day and day for our next breath, for our next meal, for our next paycheck. Uh, and we have to admit, we have to own that we desperately and that we depend on the Lord in every situation. And prayer is the language of trusting in the Lord. When we pray, we're saying, without saying the words, I need you, I depend on you. I need your answer. And then you can send up short prayers <clears throat> whenever you have the opportunity. You know, every prayer doesn't have to be, you know, something Charles Spurgeon wrote that we've memorized somehow. It can just be simple language, but heartfelt language. Uh, when somebody's on your mind, I mean many times, I've had somebody on my mind or come to my mind two or three times that I haven't talked to, I don't know why, I'm wondering if something's going on with them, I call and say, hey, what's going on with you? Why do you ask? I said, well, you've been on my mind for some reason, something's going on, what is it? Go ahead and spill things. You know? Um, Somebody comes under your mind, you think of a loved one or friend, you can say a short prayer for them. When somebody asks you to pray, if it's possible, pray right then. Even just a short little prayer. You can, you can follow it up later with eloquence, but go ahead and say a little, little prayer for them. Let me give you an example. You know Nehemiah? Uh, Nehemiah was in captivity. They'd gone into Babylon. Persia had conquered Babylon. The king of Persia is Artaxerxes. Nia is the cupbearer. It is against the law of the Persians and the Medes to show any sadness when you're in the presence of the king because that's supposed to give you great joy to be in the presence of the king. And if you show sadness, you could be killed for it. Nehemiah, the cupbearer, you know, he's making sure the king's not getting poisoned. He's in the presence of the king and he's sad. And the king notices it. And Nehemiah is afraid for his life. And the king asks him, why are you sad? What's, what's troubling you? And Nehemiah answers that he's sad because his home city, Jerusalem, is in ruins, destroyed and desolate. And so the king graciously asks Nehemiah, what do you want? Well, you all know that he got permission to take the remnant back to uh, Jerusalem and rebuild the city, rebuild the walls and all that kind of stuff. And then along with uh, a high priest, Joshua, Zerubbabel, Ezra, you know, in different waves, he got to go. But the king asked him, what do you want? And this is what the Bible says, Nehemiah 2, 4 through 5. It says, this is Nehemiah. So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king. Now, what he didn't do in the presence of the king said, can I get back to you on that? Uh, excuse me, can I run to the restroom? Can I have a few minutes and I'll come back and tell you what I want? 
No, and I bet he didn't say in front of the king out loud, I prayed to the God of heaven this prayer. He just, in a silent prayer to God, I need your help. I need to know what to ask for. You ever done that? Oh, yeah. I've done it counseling people before, you know. I can remember one instance over at Lawrenceville. I ran across a situation. I, in my own humanness, in my own play, I mean, I didn't understand this at all, and I had nothing to say. And they were both sitting in front of me looking at me, and so I just kind of put my head down. I thought, Lord, if you got anything you want these people to know to hear, this would be an excellent moment to let me in on it. <laughs> you know, and he did. That was cute. <clears throat> So when you can, you can just send up a brief silent prayer to God. <coughs> and then spend time with God in His Word each morning and use the words of God to pray to God. Psalms are excellent for this, but you can use any scripture to do it. If you don't feel like making up words or just running down your list of the things you want and you just want to pray to God and spend time with God, use the words of scripture to talk to God. <coughs> And finally, if you need to, for inspiration, motivation, read good books, let me stress good, about prayer or about people who prayed. Uh, A Journey to Victorious Praying by Bill Thrasher is good. Or Answers to Prayer, by George, which is taken out of George Mueller's journal. Or George Mueller of Bristol is a biography about him being a praying person. It's absolutely fantastic. You get through and you think, how can my faith be this small and his faith be so big? He started an orphanage. There were tons of orphans in England at the time. He started, he didn't have money, he didn't have a building, just in his home where they were, they started an orphanage and it grew. And his one promise Communication between God was, God, I'm not going to go out and beat the drum. I'm not going to wave the flag. I'm not going to raise money. I'm not going to speak in 33 churches and ask for a donation. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. But he and God decided that he was that he would just go to God in prayer and say, this is our need. And that's all he ever did. And as long as George Mueller was around, that orphanage did very, very well. If you need to read about other people who pray and live lives of prayer, get a good biography about somebody like that. It's still inspiring you. It'll motivate you. So pray without ceasing. And then he says, and everything give thanks. Again, what does this command mean? It means that in whatever situation or circumstances we are in, we are to give thanks to our sovereign and good Lord and Savior. Paul puts it like this, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in Ephesians chapter 5. Giving thanks in everything does not mean that we're happy with every situation. It does not mean that we must resign ourselves to accept matters as they are without praying or working for change. But it does mean that in the midst of all those things that we are still grateful to God for what we have in Now, it helps a lot if you feel thankful (laughs) when you thank God, but we don't always feel thankful. And you can obey without the feeling lining up right away. You know, when God takes us through hard trials, we don't feel particularly thankful. But by faith, by faith, we can say, Lord, I trust you. I trust that you are good. I trust that you know what you are doing more than I know what I'm doing. I trust that you have my best eternal interest at heart, even in this situation, difficult situation. And I submit to your sovereign hand, to your sovereign purpose, to your sovereign will, to your sovereign power, knowing that you will work it together for my good, either here or in eternity. So like rejoicing always and always giving thanks, Uh, praying without ceasing, always giving thanks, is a choice that we make to believe God even in our difficult circumstances. And I thought, how can we develop the habit, the attitude, the, the life response, the stance, the posture of living to always give thanks in everything? Well, I think you have to have a deep understanding or deepen your understanding of the sovereignty and goodness of God. Um, 
I think of Joseph's story in Genesis 37 through 50. Joseph's older brothers hated him because he had a prophecy from God and seemed to be favored by their father. And so they planned to kill him, but then they thought we can profit from this. One brother bargained for his life. They saw a caravan going by to Egypt, and they sold him into slavery, cruelly so. And then when he got there, he was an excellent service for Potiphar, but Potiphar's wife had eyes for him. He ran. She accused him. He gets thrown into prison, and he wasn't even guilty. While he's in prison, he interprets the dream of the king's cupbearer, Pharaoh's cupbearer, and for a baker. The dreams come true. The cupbearer is released, and Joseph says, please remember me before Pharaoh. He goes, I will, but he forgot. Two years later, <laughs> uh, Pharaoh has a dream, and the cupbearer remembers, hey, there's a Hebrew in prison that I forgot that can interpret the dream. He interprets Pharaoh's dream, you know, seven lean years, plenty of years, seven lean years, and Pharaoh says, what better man to implement a plan to get through this than Joseph? And like that, he became second unto Pharaoh in all of Egypt. Later, his brothers, who were part of the famine, uh, came to him for grain. They didn't, they recognized Joseph. Uh, they didn't recognize, but Joseph recognized them. And later, he was able to see his aged father, Jacob, again. After Jacob died, though, the brothers were afraid that Joseph would now get even with them now that their father had died, and they went to him with this concern, and at that point, Joseph wept. And this is what he said. Am I in God's place? Am I God? And then he revealed the truth that had sustained him and given him hope through all those awful years that he had endured. And it was this. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. And Joseph's planning and administration to storehouse grain kept people alive. And that was what brought <laughs> Jacob and about 70 members of his family into Egypt to stay 430 years to produce a great nation so that they could be set free and become the people of God. And Joseph, before he knew how it was going to come out, he saw God as both sovereign and good. And he submitted to God. And that is the key to having a thankful heart, brothers and sisters. And you've got to make trusting God your habit. Thankfulness will be our habit when trusting God is our habit. Thankfulness and trust are bound together. Let me say this, if you're grumbling, then you're not trusting. And if you're not trusting, then you're not thankful. Trust God consistently, especially when there's trouble, especially in the trials, and you will thank Him for His great salvation and for the privilege that you have of having Him walk through this with you and for the privilege that you have of seeking Him in your time. I've said this before. I don't know how an unbeliever makes it through trouble. <laughs> Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And in everything give thanks. That's a pretty good way to live. You know? That would make you become the person you would like to be. Thirteen years before he was converted, John Wesley thought he was a Christian already. He attended Oxford University in England, a theology religion major, going to be ordained in the Anglican Church. He thought he had it going. This is 13 years before he actually got converted. He thought he was already there. The colleges at Oxford, has anybody ever been there? Anybody ever been to Oxford? Um, it looks like 
one huge university, very old architecture, but it's really multiple colleges in these buildings, and each one will have its own buildings and rooms and courtyard. You've seen the courtyards of a grass lawn in between these buildings. And at the gate to one of these colleges, they'll have a little room to the side when you go in, and there will be someone there called a porter, kind of like a railroad porter in a way. They lock and unlock and put the mail in the cubby holes and run errands and do things like that. They had a somewhat low station in life. They were, uh, especially back in John Wesley's time, they were quite poor. One day John Wesley is having a conversation with a porter who is an avid, strong, and mature Christian. And from this conversation, John Wesley came to believe that there was more to Christianity than he had experienced. The porter had just one thin coat. Back then, they'd wear two or three coats at a time. He just had this one little thin coat. He had eaten no food that day. He had no quarters, really, of his own. And yet, as they talked, he let it be known that his heart was full of gratitude to God. And John Wesley asked him, you thank God when you have nothing to wear, nothing to eat, and no bed to lie upon? Well, what else do you thank God for? And the porter said, I thank you that he has given me life and being and a heart to love him and a desire to serve him. That speaks loudly, does it not? I mean, that speaks loudly, doesn't it? Coming from somebody who doesn't, he's not on top of the world, he doesn't have all the answers, everything's not working his way, but for somebody in need to talk that, that speaks loudly, doesn't it? I see those pictures of those kids in Silway, that speaks loudly, doesn't it? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Now we might not obey these commands perfectly, but make no mistake, we should be making progress to do so. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And if we believe Him and rely on His Spirit, our lives will certainly be better for you have enough faith to believe that we can do these things in God, in His strength, that we can rejoice in the Lord and pray like somebody calls for the of God, and in everything, be grateful to God. And then won't we shine like lights in the darkness? Amen. Is it your desire to want to do this? to change, to be like this. That when somebody encounters you, they encounter your light. The light of Jesus Christ shining through you. That would make it a sweet place. Would it not? Lord, we submit to you and we yield to you today. You are our sovereign, all-powerful, and good God. We yield to your son Jesus and we listen to his commands through the Apostle Paul and we resolve today that we want to keep your word, all of it and that we want to progress we want to move through the process of becoming like you give us your strength let your spirit be heavy upon us in your name we pray Amen God bless you go and do the things that God says.